Benjamin from Eclipse here, uh, back for another virtual IoT meetup, a virtual IoT webinar. Uh, today, we're very happy to have a Johan from uh, the Things Network. You may have seen, uh, well, there's lots of IoT related Kickstarter uh, projects and, well, and other uh, crowdfunding projects out there. This one is particularly interesting because it deals with uh, LoRa One and building open source and open uh, crowdsourced um, IoT networks. So that's uh, actually quite an interesting topic. The campaign, I think, still has uh, eight days to go or something, and we thought it would be great to have uh, uh, an overview of what it is about and um, how you can get involved. That's an open source project, right? So um, as always, if you have questions, please ask them on Twitter, virtual IoT hashtag, or you can also use the Q&A on, on Google+. Plus. Post the questions on Meetup, uh, whatever um, whatever you like. I will make sure to collect those and ask them to, to Johan. Um, so without further ado, Johan, welcome. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks for, for joining us. Thanks. So uh, feel free to quickly introduce yourself and, and get started with your, with your presentation. I'm very much looking forward to it. Thank you, Benjamin, for the introduction. So, uh, hi, everybody. My name is uh, Johan Stokken. Um, I'm from Amsterdam. And most of all, I'm a software programmer. I am a um, C Sharp developer, and I started developing Go for the Things Network. Um, I have a uh, commercial projects I do are mostly in sports timing uh, for sports federations. And I did my graduate internship at Accenture as a strategy consultant. So, I had experience in you know low level hardware interfacing software development as well as uh, aligning powerpoint presentations i'm not really good at that as you will see later uh, anyway um since june i am the co-founder and tech lead of the things network and uh, we are um, a non-profit foundation and our mission is to create an open decentralized and crowdsourced internet of things data network um, I have two presentations. I wanna, I wanna, I'll get you through quickly. Uh, the first one will be a general introduction about the Things Network, and the second one is uh, diving a bit deeper in the technical architecture and also uh, how you, as a developer, can get your data and work with our network. So I will share my screen, and then hopefully. If everything works, I have my first slide here. And so this is the introduction. Um, in Internet of Things, as most of you know, there are a few wireless uh, protocols that can be used for your devices to communicate with the network. Um, first one is Wi-Fi. We have uh, Bluetooth and uh, 3G. Well, the problem with those is that um, Wi-Fi is very consuming, power consuming. Uh, it's an access point uh, protocol, so it requires you to connect to a specific uh, access point. Um, the range is really low, uh, although the bandwidth is really high, but it is usually not required for Internet of Things. Uh, Bluetooth is also um, uh, access point protocol um, range with uh, could be bit higher but it's also still problematic um, power is also an issue um, 3g uh, range is good um, you have almost everywhere coverage but it's most of all it's expensive you need a data subscription and um, it's also uh, power consuming so um, what we need is something else and what the uh, industry came up with, as most of you know, is LoRa. And LoRa is a long range protocol. It's very power efficient, high capacity, low bandwidth. Uh, it's low cost and it's uh, in a very um, small form factor. So LoRa is designed by the LoRa Alliance. And the LoRa Alliance is a group of telecom providers, chip makers, and other industry leaders in Internet of Things. And they decided to design an open, um, specification for uh, um, communication of uh, end devices with um, with uh, ex with uh, gateways. Uh, those are the base stations. So it's a radio protocol. There is no point-to-point -point connection, and um, 
it uses the free frequencies, so the 868 frequency, for example, or the 433 in the US, or 915 megahertz. And um, uh, it has a very good, um, clear, uh, accessible ex uh, specifications. Um, so what we basically came up with is very technology push. So we saw a gateway from Curlink, and um, it's a French company, and uh, the gateway costs 1,200 euros. And we thought, okay, if we put this gateway in uh, in Amsterdam, where we live, and we place a few others, how many would we need to have city coverage? So, well, the calculations was easy. It would be about five or six gateways, and it would cost um, six, seven thousand euros. So. If we would connect them all, we would have citywide coverage um, uh, without needing to have a commercial operator, and we could, you know, uh, talk directly to end devices. So from that, from basically from the technology, we formulated this mission, and it was to build a decentralized, open, and crowdsourced Internet of Things data network, which is owned and operated by the community. So we are not a telecom provider; we don't own the network. Um, it is the people that buy the gateways. And basically, the gateways are connected to uh, to uh, um, decentralized um, services that connect with each other. There's some network discovery, as I will introduce later. Um, and that is the mission. So the next thing was to present this mission at the Internet of Things meetup in Amsterdam. It's a very active group of Internet of Things enthusiasts. And this was in first days of July. And from this. We had a lot of positive feedback, and we already had the first guys on board that wanted to join our community. So a few days later, we had our meeting. Uh, this is in Amsterdam with uh, a few Dutch guys. Uh, this is me um, calling in from uh, from uh, uh, remote where I was working, and we had yeah, designed the first prototypes and the ideas to to, to you know come up with. Um, with a new vision and strategy for, for what we then started to call the Things Network. So this is what we had in mind. Um, this is a map of Amsterdam with uh, the gateways on the map. Um, so the gateways, depending on their location, their range is between two and five kilometers in, uh, in, in, in urban areas. And when you have uh, line of sight you can go up to 20 25 kilometers um, so this is um, um, this is what we what we had in mind and the logos you see here are our partners and they are companies that we worked for they are co-working spaces that we work in they were people working there that we knew and we called them and we said hey uh, do you want to buy a gateway um, this is our idea you put it on your roof and that's it and uh, they all said yes, so we went there, we installed the gateways, and uh, we had city coverage in only six weeks. So that uh, got a lot of media attention, and um, we wanted to develop a recipe for other cities to use. So um, uh, we wanted to build communities in different cities, uh, but as we are not only um, uh, a foundation, that is non-profit. We also don't want to be a very central, uh, top-down um, organization. So we wanted to have communities be autonomous. Uh, they can use our brand, and they can uh, connect with our backend, or they can set up their own architecture. Everything. Um, so this was the first article that was um, published by the Next Web, and from that we got a lot of media attention. Uh, which really helped us to to find more people and build the community. Uh, then we thought, okay, so we are working on uh, a uh, platform and a network, um, but for for a lot of people that are not an Internet of Things, it's really hard to understand what we actually are doing and what you can do with this network. So um, we decided to design a use case, uh, which was a really typical Amsterdam use case. You have all these canal boats. And um, uh, they are uh, running water, and we thought, okay, well, let's let's make a small device that you can put in your boat, and once it runs water, uh, it will send a, a text message to you. And if you reply to the text message, somebody actually goes to your boat and, cl and clears it. So it is a very simple use case that would 
uh, show everybody, uh, especially in Amsterdam, that's what we were most active in at the time, uh, what we were doing. And then we had our launching conference. This was in, in August. This was already uh, a few weeks after we started. And there were 200 people that are, were very interested in, in seeing what we were doing. And these were friends and companies we work with and people that actually bought a gateway or Internet of Things enthusiasts. And uh, this is uh, us the, uh, with Winka and myself during the presentations. And then um, a lot of communities started, and this was only in the in the very beginning. Um, communities that all around the world started to adopt our idea and wanted to deploy uh, the same thing as we did in Amsterdam in their own city or their own area. So these are currently the most active communities. Um, there are a lot of more. Uh, you can go to our forum, as I will. Uh, show later where you can get in touch with people in your area. Uh, there's probably already somebody working on the Things Network uh, close to you or in your country. Um, one of the one of the communities I want to mention here is the Brazil community. Uh, they have their uh, they started very early with their uh, Facebook page and they have videos and they organize meetups. Um, they have T-shirts that we don't even have. And uh, it's really cool to see a very active community out there, and uh, and we we have a lot of uh, contact with them. So for us to to um, to make it uh, to make it grow, um, I think we should make it as developer and maker friendly as possible. And for that, we need to be fully compliant with the LoRa One specification. So LoRa One is uh, a stack, and uh, it has. Um, uh, presentation. Uh, it has a. It has a, a lot of. Um, um, it's a lot of um, details that uh, are. Some are really easy to implement. Some are harder to implement. But uh, it's really important that you would be fully compliant with it, so people could actually start using the Things Network and switch to a commercial operator or work with a commercial operator and switch back to the Things Network. Um, and we also want to, one of our de design principles, as I will introduce uh, in a bit later, is that we want to do everything open source and only use open standards. And open source is not only the software that we develop, but also uh, the hardware specifications. So um, we, do, uh, we are currently running a Kickstarter, and um, we are uh, coming up with a gateway. Uh, I will show you later. And we are releasing all the hardware specifications required to build the gateway yourself. Um, next to that, we have Arduino development kits, and we have a very active community. We have a forum, a wiki, we have communication on Slack, we have the, the GitHub uh, for code sharing. Uh, there's a simple Android app where you can see the, the data, the raw data. Uh, this is also designed by the community. And um, I think as, if we make it as developer and maker friendly as possible, then uh, we can actually get somewhere. So we started a Kickstarter, and Kickstarter, we are selling three products. One is the Things Gateway. The second one is the, um, the Things Uno. It's an Arduino Uno compatible development kit, uh, which has a, a LoRa chip on board. And it is the, the third one is the Things Note. And it's a simple button and a few sensors. And you can program anything to this button. And uh, we started this uh, Kickstarter target is 150,000 euro. And uh, this is uh, just right after we launched it uh, in a conference in Brussels. And I just made a screenshot. So uh, with seven days to go, we have uh, over 130% pledged. Um, and uh, this, is, this really gives us some validation from the community that a crowdsourced open free model actually works. And we will be shipping the gateways from July uh, next year, June, July. And um, everybody is still able to, to pledge um, uh, or contact us, or if, and we answer any question here. Um, this is an example of the gateways that this is in the Netherlands, uh, the gateways that are uh, put on the map. So once you buy a gateway, uh, we send you an email, and um, you, can, you can indicate where you will uh, place your gateway. And this is only, well, 25% of the people actually do that. And this screenshot is already a few weeks old. But uh, this is where you can see that we covered uh, most of the um, urban area in, in the Netherlands already. 
so this is still with uh, uh, a few weeks of uh, the Kickstarter to go, and also with not every gateway on the map. So this is this is pretty good for us uh, to start with. Uh, some of the use cases are, you know, uh, for example, parking lots where you can measure uh, if there's a car. It's you know you can you can imagine basically everything. So that is the introduction of Things Network. Um, I'm gonna go back really quickly to Benjamin if there are any questions already or not really. I don't see any yet, but as a okay. as a reminder, please use the virtual IoT hashtag or um, um, yeah, use the, the Q and A on, on on Google Plus. But yeah, we are uh, we are approaching forty people watching us live, so I'm I'm sure you guys have questions. Feel free to just tell let us know. Back to you. Okay, so now I want to dive a bit more deeper in the technical architecture of the Things Network. Um, so I oversee the technical development that includes the uh, primarily the what we call the core of the Things Network that uh, that are the cloud services, and um, so the hardware and the that we are selling on the Kickstarter uh, those are necessary for us to grow the network. Also, because there are not so many um, uh, gateways that are affordable on the market, um, and also we want to support the, the developer and maker community uh, with um, uh, with development kits to to start working easily. Uh, but what we see as the, as the core of our network are the open source components uh, to route the data from the nodes to the right application and back. Um, so this is a short timeline. Um, as I just introduced, we started in July with this very simple prototype. We had our demonstration conference in, in, in August. Um, we gathered a lot of input from experienced community members from all around the world, people in networking, people in, in, in embedded software, in cloud software, in, in, in routing, in security. Uh, then we had uh, the, the uh, network architecture um, that we will use um, what we will start with that will be available uh, at the end of this year. Uh, currently, we are implementing that and testing it. And uh, then we will start with the first integrations with, um, with external uh, cloud service platforms and also with uh, products that are using the Things Network. So the design principles for the architecture is, um, first of all, we need to be fully compliant with the specification. We want to have a decentralized architecture. And um, also, there is a geographical segmentation. And that means that if you have an application in Brazil and your node is in Brazil, you ideally want to uh, keep your data as local as possible. So don't send it over the ocean back and forth. Uh, so we need to come up with efficient routing to reduce the bandwidth. And um, what is also really important is the trust-based model. And trust-based model means that both the nodes developers the, the, and the application developer, it could be the same company, but it's not necessarily the case, uh, they choose um, to which party they connect to. Uh, and since LoRa is a radio protocol, all the gateways receive all the data from every node that is inside, if it's the Things Network or not. And gateway owners, they buy a gateway, and we feel that it's their internet connection, so uh, they are in control of where the data goes. And um, these are called routers. I will uh, send. I will introduce that uh, in the next slide. Uh, the cloud services, uh, and then on the other hand, we have the application. Um, which wants to receive the data. And the application uh, connects also to, to, um, to a cloud service to get the data from. And our goal is uh, to make this work in a decentralized way. So with network service discovery uh, and um, uh, security to, to make it work. And if you compare this with the commercial operator, uh, then you just have to deal with one commercial operator. You know where to go to, you know where your data comes from. Um, so that is, that is different. And then finally, end-to-end -end encryption means that uh, we as a platform, only as a network, we, we cannot unpack your data, we cannot see what's in it, everything is encrypted and only the application and node developer knows the secret key to unpack it. So geographical segmentation, um, it means that um, 
if you see here on the left, the uh, circles, they uh, indicate the uh, gateways and uh, they have they are placed in a different segment, as you can see with uh, different colors. And segments can be overlapping. And the reason why we use segmentation is because um, the device address space in uh, LoRa 1 is limited to four bytes. So that is the classical problem that IP version 4 has. Um, and to, to deal with that, um, and also to keep the data as close as possible, we use segmentation. So we place gateways in a specific segments and gateways that are uh, on the edge uh, with and uh, near another segment, they are uh, virtually placed in two segments. And uh, nodes that are known uh, to uh, uh, a specific segment, they are unknown to the other segment unless they are in the edge area. And we come up with some handover uh, between the segments, uh, so we support roaming nodes. And you should see the size of the segments. Uh, they are they are like states or countries, so they are pretty big. Um, well, regarding security, uh, LoRa One prescribes um, basically two layers of security. The first one is um, the network, and the second one is the application. For routing, we uh, we use the network security to check the message integrity. Uh, but we leave the application encryption and decryption up to the node and the application that finally receives the data. So that is how we manage to um, uh, support end-to-end -end encryption. The, um, uh, the, there are a few attacks possible on Internet of Things, and especially because it's a radio protocol, you can basically send any data over the air, and you can also record all the data. So you can easily come up with a replay attack or a clone attack. Uh, and for that, we uh, come up with uh, various mitigations in our backend to, to uh, detect this and to track the state of nodes centrally. Um, and uh, we are also working with, uh, with uh, parties in the LoRa Alliance uh, to to test, come up with a test environment to see um, uh, the security of our network, and also there is an um, accountancy firm Deloitte um, offered to uh, help us out with um, auditing our security model. The core components uh, of the Things Network, we basically have six of them. Uh, first of all, we have the gateway, and that is the device that people or companies or education institutes or cities buy and place um, all around the area. Uh, then we have a few cloud services. First of all, we have the router, and it basically routes the raw packets uh, to a broker, and the broker uh, sits basically between the application handler and the router. Uh, then we have a network server, which is um, uh, which is which manages the data rate and the frequencies of the nodes. It's uh, something obligatory in LoRa to use because nodes uh, in LoRa, they can use different frequencies and they can also uh, use different data rates depending on, um, on their settings uh, based on how well they are in reach of a gateway and other factors. Uh, so it's for us, it's important to keep track of that. Uh, then we have the handler, and the handler acts on behalf of the application, and it, it does the decryption, and deduplication, and geolocalization. And finally, we have the application developed by the uh, application developer. So maybe in an overview, one, maybe yeah. just one quick question regarding uh, data rates. Uh, what kind of uh, data rates are we talking about? Like, is it one message per hour? Uh, is there any actual limitation in terms of, of regulations and, and stuff like that? Yeah, um, that's, a, that's a very good question. Uh, we are currently um, designing a model for defining the rules to use our network, and it's 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 a little bit complicated. If you just look at the data rate, uh, so that is how fast you can send data over the LoRa network, uh, it's uh, variable and it varies between 300 bits per second up to 50 kilobits per second. And um, if you 
if you are uh, further away from a gateway, you can choose to lower your data rate so you can get your data, uh, you know, it's, it's, and if you're next to a gateway, you can easily use um, a higher data rate. Uh, so that is regarding the data rate. If you look at um, the norms, uh, for example, uh, in, in Europe, we have the Etsy norms, and uh, it, 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 it's, it's basically, it says, uh, it gives all, all kinds of rules and regulations for wireless communication. And uh, for example, there's a duty cycle. You cannot block the channel for more than a number of seconds. And um, so, and you, basically, with uh, the data rate uh, combined with the uh, the norms and the number of nodes you want to serve on the gateway, and the capabilities of the chipset, uh, it's it's a big model that that comes that um, that can calculate. Uh, the rules for using the network and the rules are for example uh, that we do not allow the airtime uh, more more than 30 second airtime per 24 hours on average of a few days that is that is one of the most important rules that we will come up with so what that means is that you cannot send um, you cannot take more than 30 seconds time per 24 hours to send the data if you use a high data rate uh, you can easily send up to 500 messages per 24 hour. If you use a low data rate, uh, it will be less. And it will uh, depend on the data rate, and that will, again, that will depend on the connection you have with the gateway. Uh, we will come up with a model for this and also uh, uh, sample calculations for developers and makers uh, to, uh, to, to ha have as a reference. Um, generally, these rules that we come up with are um, less strict than what commercial operators will use. Um, but that is something that will be published over the next few weeks. Uh, we plan to, um, to publish our rules uh, in, uh, in, in one or two weeks or so. So that is regarding the, the data rate and the rules. Um, I got a question about the limits. Yeah, so that's also uh, related. If we can send one message per hour, uh, yes, you can at least send one message per hour, even with the lowest data rate. Uh, I think you should expect about 50 messages per 24 hour. Um, the reason why we uh, choose to take an average over a few days is, for example, uh, you connect your uh, doorbell to Laura and you throw a big party and you have a um, uh, hundred people coming and they all press the doorbell, uh, then you don't want your your uh, your data to be ignored after you reach the 30 second airtime. Uh, so we we have some uh, uh, we have some we have some toleration there. Uh, what are the limits um, at the gateway level? Like if I were to uh, to use a LoRa chip and, and the Raspberry Pi to build my own uh, LoRa gateway, how many nodes can be connected to to the gateway? <sighs> Um, well, theoretically, if you look at high data rates, the highest data rate and nodes that are sending the data right after each other, you would go up to 60,000 nodes per gateway. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at it more realistically, uh, I think it will be between five and 10,000 that you can that you can actually uh, serve. Um, we use a PicoCell approach, so that means that uh, there are a lot of gateways. Uh, around uh, that is ideal, so you ha you always have four or five gateways inside, uh, based on how many gateways are installed by the community, of course. And um, this means that if, because it's a radio protocol, if one gateway is too busy to handle the message, uh, then there are uh, one or two or three or maybe ten other gateways around uh, that maybe have a channel free to uh, to handle the message. Uh, so that, that is also um, uh, gives a lot of more capacity um, uh, with using a picocell approach instead of a macrocell approach where you would only have a few gateways uh, per city. Uh, so um, and that's regarding the uh, uh, the capacity of the gateway. Um, so this is the overview of how the uh, core components are connected. So on the left you see the gateways. Uh, with the um, triangles, those are the nodes, and they are 
place in the in the segment. They send the data to a router, and the gateways are pre-configured to to work with uh, with the specific router. And could could also be two routers. Uh, we as the Things Network Foundation will provide a hosted um, solution, which is a, the a hosted instance of the router. But since it's an open source component, you can just grab your Docker image and spin it up, and uh, and you have your own router. Uh, then we have the broker, and again the broker decouples uh, the, the the gateways and the router from the application. And between the router and the broker, there is a network service discovery. So uh, routers they they use uh, some some tracking or or some, some yeah some like a, a BitTorrent tracking mechanism or blockchain uh, to discover uh, new brokers. Uh, in, in the initial implementation that we will, will uh, that we will um, um, uh, publish uh, this year um, or in the beginning of next year, it will just be a simple list and some some basic network discovery. Uh, but this is really something that is really decoupling and um, and, and not a not a static uh, connection. Then the purple one, the handler. Uh, again, the handler acts on behalf of the application. So the application on the on the right, the A, chooses uh, the handler to to work with, and the handler also has the uh, decryption keys for the data. So there are a few options here. Uh, application can use the hosted handler uh, by the foundation, uh, and then of course the that handler would need the um, secret application key. Uh, or, uh, as you can see below, you can also integrate the handling functionality in your application because this is also an open source component, uh, so you can secure your keys. And you should basically uh, compare this with um, web server security. So if you have a, a website hosted somewhere, you have a web shop, and you have a TLS SSL certificate, um, you give your private key to your hoster so it can uh, set up secure connections for you. Uh, if you don't want that, you can also uh, manage your own uh, uh, infrastructure and, and, and your own handler in this case. So two examples that are between the application and the handler are uh, Node-RED. Uh, Node-RED is a very nice open source component by IBM, which is a graphical user interface to drag and drop uh, uh, notes processing notes with each other and you can you can do anything you can do basically anything with it uh, initiate simple functions or do calculations and second one is for example uh, a cloud platform uh, we as a thing network uh, will not uh, start developing um, a cloud platform uh, we believe that there are many already uh, many to choose from and we want to build integrations with uh, cloud platforms as I will I present a bit later. So you have an application and um, you want to register it. Well, that's pretty simple. You pick your handler, could be the hosted handler or the integrated one, and you tell the broker, "Hey, I want to uh, I want to work with you." So you give your unique application ID to the broker, and from then then on, uh, the broker knows uh, that it can handle data uh, for your application. So it's just a simple registration. Um, so gateway setup, uh, as introduced before, we have geographical segmentation. Uh, for example, we have the, the, the top one is in uh, segment one and knows that it's near segment two. Then we have two that are in segment two, but they are near segment one and three. And then below we have one in segment three that is uh, also knows that it's near segment two. And they all send their data to a router, and they send data to the broker. Again, this is a network service discovery. Uh, it can also be another router, uh, your own router, or um, for example, we work with uh, with the ports. Uh, and they want to set up their own network infrastructure. So they have their own gateways, they have their own router, their own broker, everything uh, they use themselves. But they may use um, the community's gateways and the foundation's router and broker as a backup. Um, so you can, you can get the data to their broker also uh, from the community um, and, 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 and vice versa. So packet routing, if you have the uh, node on the left, uh, which is inside of two gateways, uh, this is a, a sample device address. 
it sends the, the gateway sends the data to the router. Uh, but there is also another gateway that has the, um, the node inside, so it also sees the same payload. And, um, and the router receives basically uh, the same package twice, but the first one is from segment one uh, and could also be segment two. And um, the second one says, yeah, it's it's primarily, I'm primarily in segment one, but I'm near uh, segment one, segment three as well. So this node could be there as well. Uh, so that is used for addressing because, um, for example, if you have an underground waste container, in uh, New York, you can easily uh, use the same device address in Boston because they will never uh, see each other and uh, they will not collide. But using segmentation, you can you can keep these um, uh, separate. Um, to actually to be sure that you are talking to uh, the right node that you expect it to be, uh, you always have to do a message integrity check, and that is in, in LoRa one specifications. It's called the, the message integrity check, the MIC check. And um, uh, it's uh, based on the network security key. Um, so then the network knows uh, that it's dealing with the specific node. So the device address can be reused and can, it can be collisions, uh, but the final check is with the security key. So then this is the discovery uh, process. Um, this is the device address. And it basically asks the the broker, the router asks the broker, "Hey, uh, can you can you deal with this data? Do you do you know about this device address uh, in, in in this or that segment?" And then a broker responds, "Yeah, I can," or "No, I cannot." And now the router knows, and it's basically a self-learning algorithm here uh, that once it sees uh, a message from this node in, in this segment, that it this broker can actually handle it. But again, this could be uh, uh, a colliding device address. So uh, it could be something that the broker cannot handle, uh, but at least the broker said that it might handle this data. So the router chooses this broker to send the data to, and um, so there goes the data, and uh, then it sends the uh, package to the handler. So this is when the application registered the uh, handler on the broker. Uh, and this is also where the de decryption ha happens because the secret application key is only known to the handler. In LoRa, there are two ways to um, registering register your node. First of all, you have personalization, and the second one is over-the-air activation. And you can compare this with static and dynamic IP addresses. With personalization, you actually hard code your device address and a network security key in the device. And when you're using over the air activation, uh, the device sends a join request message and it basically says, hey, this is my application ID, uh, this is my unique device ID. Uh, I know my application key, but I will not expose it. Uh, and I will join, in, I want to join the network. Uh, and then the network has to find the, the right application and registers it on the network and it gets a temporary device address. Uh, since we support the LoRa 1 specification, uh, we will support both personalization and over-the-air activation. So over-the-air activation, the way it works uh, is that the application first registers itself with a unique uh, uh, application ID, it's the app EUI. And when a node wants to wants to join, it basically sends a join request message uh, with that same app EUI and its unique uh, device EUI. Uh, it's also picked up by the other gateway, so um, uh, the router receives this message twice. Uh, and then it's the same network discovery. The router asks the brokers it knows um, if it works for this specific app EUI. If there's a malicious broker that always responds yes, that's fine. Um, there is a security check here that uh, the message should be signed by the application with the secret app key that is only known uh, to the application, in this case the application handler, uh, and uh, also only known in the nodes. So this is where end-to-end -end encryption comes in. So the brokers, they respond yes and no. Uh, then we have our network server, and this is 
the one that uh, manages the data rates of the nodes as well as the frequencies uh, and it handles the MAC commands. Those are commands that are um, used for LoRa uh, communication uh, between gateways and nodes. Um, the temporary address that the node gets is assigned randomly. Uh, so again, it could be a collision, but collisions are detected by uh, checking the message integrity using the network security key. And then the broker, uh, the application signs the message with the secret key and uh, it doesn't expose the application key, but it only gives the signed message back. So the broker sends a join accept and the router uh, sends the join accept back to the gateway uh, that has the highest signal strength with the node. And from then on, the node can use the things network with the temporary device address and it's registered with this specific application. So that is how over the air activation works. Well, network management, uh, it's similar. Uh, there is some packets. Uh, it goes from the router to the broker. The MAC commands that are used for, for LoRa uh, to work are sent to the network server and application payload is sent to the application. So what we want to do with these open source components is to decouple everything that's LoRa related uh, from the application. So one of the most frequently asked questions I get is how to get data. Um, so we have uh, integrations with, uh, for example, Node-RED, as I introduced earlier, but also with uh, Amazon Web Services, IoT Platform, the IBM Bluemix, Fireware, OpenSensors.io, uh, the Things.io, uh, and what we are uh, essentially uh, doing is um, making the data available to any Internet of Things platform that people want to use, and since it's open source, anybody can can uh, develop their own integration. So that is it's the third option. So the second option here is the Node-RED integration. And the first one would be to connect your application directly with, uh, with the handler, with the, uh, uh, with, which is either hosted by the foundation or hosted by yourself. Um, and the fourth one is that you can integrate the handler functionality in your application. So you can also uh, do everything yourself from scratch. Um, so then, um, yeah, a yeah. quick question maybe from from Roman. Uh, well, the question was asked a few minutes ago at the um, at the application layer, and especially for people who would use the um, uh, uh, the open source um, handler. What's uh, well, of course, it seems to be MQTT, right? But is there um, an extra layer like Ipso smart objects to actually? describe the sensor semantics in a in a common and standard way or what's the yeah what's the format for, for the data that people actually consume yeah that's a very good question um so with laura the message size is limited to 51 bytes with the lower data rates if you have a higher data rate you can send up to 200 bytes um if you if you if you you know, if you want to be safe and you program everything for 51 bytes, um, ideally you want to pack as much information as possible. So you don't want to put any XML in or, or JSON in, you just do everything binary encoded. Uh, so uh, this information is only known to the nodes and the application developer. So those are the guys who, who designed the, 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 the format of the payload. Uh, and um, uh, the Things Network doesn't really know what it's what it's handling or what it's dispatching back and forth. Um, so this is something that application developers has to do themselves. But with Node-RED, for example, you can easily write a JavaScript function uh, that uh, unpacks your uh, your data, decodes it, and puts it in a in a in a, in a very simple uh, a JSON object. Uh, and Node-RED also has a, an MQTT connector to send it to your own MQTT broker uh, that only accepts formatted data structure or, or whatever you want. Uh, we also work with, um, for example, with the Fireware integration, and I think it will be also used for other integrations. 
Uh, we work with um, with a very nice component that we developed together with um, with a company uh, we work with. It's called uh, Kukua, and um, the component that they are developing is called Concava, and Concava stands for Convert, Validate, and Calibrate. Uh, in, in the other order. Anyway, um, what it does, it confirms the binary data to uh, to some format. So it could be that it that it the, the first four bytes are the latitude and the, the second four bytes are the longitude. Uh, then it does some calibration. So it, it may uh, convert the um, Celsius decrease in Celsius to Fahrenheit or converts a voltage to to something that's meaningful and finally it does validation so it checks whether it's uh, whether it makes sense uh, the, the values so that is a component uh, that's also being developed open source that you can also plug in here uh, but what the handler essentially does is just posting the raw data uh, to an MQTT broker and, and to a platform, uh, but you can you can use functions in the red or this uh, concava component to convert it to structured data uh, that your application can use. Um, so we have four teams. The first one is the architecture team. We have the network access team. Uh, we have a core team and the integration team. So the architecture team uh, designs the architecture and uh, make sure that everything is LoRa 1 compliant and um, uh, comes with solutions for all the challenges that we have regarding decentralization and openness. Network access team, uh, they develop uh, the nodes and gateway firmwares. This is not really uh, the things network core thing because um, what we see as our core is in what the third team does basically is developing these uh, services and these services are developed in, uh, in Go. And finally we have the integration team that uh, makes everything work together basically. So it's so bundling and containerizing the integrations with the uh, uh, cloud platforms and also the uh, code samples and workshop materials. So finally, if you want to join uh, one of these teams, uh, you can go check out our forum. It's a very active community there. We have a newsletter where you can follow everything we do. Uh, you can go to GitHub if you have issues. Um, there are not so many there yet. We are currently uh, in the stage of um, setting up the infrastructure. Uh, we have a big meeting coming up next week uh, where we will actually kick off the um, development of the services in Go. Uh, finally, if you want to join, uh, send me an email, uh, joan at thingsnetwork.org, uh, and uh, I'm happy to uh, get in touch with you guys. So that's my presentation. I'm, uh, available for questions, Benjamin. Yes, and it turns out we have uh, still, uh, oh, it's night time here now. Uh, we still have a couple uh, unanswered questions, I think, both on meetup.com and on Twitter. Uh, but you still, of course, have a uh, few more minutes to ask your questions. So there's one from Jose Luis about um, at the hardware level. So apparently, well, well, I guess the question is twofold. Uh, what kind of uh, modem? What kind of chip uh, do you plan on using for for building the the, the gateways and and the like? And uh, the question is especially around um, the SX thirteen oh one from Semtech. Apparently, some people seem to have trouble sourcing the component, and there seems to be delays, lead times. So, how uh, how are you actually going to source your your modems? And any tips maybe for people interested in in building solutions on top of of LoRa modems? Yeah. So uh, currently, uh, people that want to uh, develop a gateway, they have one option, and that is the SX1301, as mentioned by Benjamin. So that is also the one that we will be using in our gateway. Um, there is a lot of demand for them, uh, and it, uh, I am not involved in the purchasing pro process of these uh, uh, of these uh, chips, but. Um, uh, we, we've had some trouble as well in the beginning. Uh, my advice would be to keep trying. Uh, I think it also helps to bundle purchasing them. So you can find people that want to, that also want to buy an XS1301. That always helps. 
you can also go to our forum where uh, people are working with the Essex 1301 or are in the process of acquiring one. Uh, so there are a few options there. That would be, uh, you know, you do it yourself gateway. Uh, second option would be to um, to buy an off-the-shelf gateway, and um, for that we advise to buy a multi-tech gateway. You can also contact me uh, to get in touch with the guys at Multitech to get your starter kit. It includes not only a gateway but also uh, a development kit to to get everything up and running. Uh, and the second option would be uh, the Curling Gateway, Curling IoT base station. Uh, that's a more, uh, a bit more professional one. You can put it outside. It has a big antenna. Uh, uh, it's a bit more expensive. It, uh, but those are those are the options. So uh, first, find people, um, make a combined uh, purchase, uh, uh, or buy an off-the-shelf gateway. Okay. Um, other well, lots of questions uh, around the hardware. I guess uh, Roman had another question about um, the limitation regarding the the duty cycling and is the all the limitations regarding duty cycling and bandwidth etc. Um, similar in the US than they would be in Europe. <laughs> Yes, they are. We, we, we come up with the, the rules and regulations that we are uh, that we will publish. They will be global. Um, uh, at least we want to. We will. The goal is to make it as as global and consistent as possible. Um, these rules are quite restrictive in some areas where there is more allowed than in other areas. Um, from my understanding, I think that US is less uh, restrictive than Europe. Um, uh, so, um, uh, and then we also have a, a margin there. So if, for example, we have some calculations where the airtime could even be higher than 30 seconds. Um, but this is something that we tell developers and makers, okay, just keep it below 30 seconds for 24 hours and you will be fine. That is basically the message. Okay, that makes sense. Um, well. A question regarding software, actually, this time. Uh, we have um, well, a member, actually, of uh, the Eclipse community, Matthias, uh, asking, asking where, uh, where the code is hosted and are there any intentions to host it in uh, a foundation such as Eclipse, actually? Ah, um, so we have uh, we, the, the code that we, uh, so again, we have, we have the, 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 currently what we have on GitHub is the demonstration version that, that essentially um, shows uh, developers and everybody that it technically works. Uh, we have our kickoff meeting of developing the core network uh, and, the, and the services as I just introduced next week. And we will be uh, posting this uh, uh, and publishing the code on GitHub. Uh, one side note there is that we had to sign as the as a foundation because we are a member of the LoRa Alliance. We are we signed a non-disclosure agreement regarding the uh, draft specifications, uh, and as we want to support the uh, latest specifications, uh, some of the uh, code that is uh, for the draft specifications will not be uh, open source, but everything else is open source. And once the specifications are uh, made public, then of course we uh, we make uh, uh, all the parts open source. Um, so um, currently we use uh, we use uh, GitHub as the uh, as a platform, but um, I'm, I'm open to to suggestions in the future or uh, switching to another uh, place. Cool. Um, well, I think we will actually probably run out of time uh, pretty soon. So yeah, you guys have a few minutes left for, to ask uh, uh, your final questions. Otherwise, uh, you can just comment on Meetup and, and we'll make sure to answer them afterwards. Uh, thank you, Johan. A few, a few general announcements. Uh, we have the Open IoT Challenge, uh, second edition still going on, right? Uh, you go to uh, iot.eclipse.org slash Open IoT Challenge. You have uh, still about 10 days to, to apply to submit your application. So I hope to see many of you submitting cool project ideas. Why not using LoRa, uh, for example? 
Um, please also remember to uh, to evaluate the, the, the Meetup group. Uh, you can do that right on, on meetup.com. It would be great to, to get your feedback uh, as well as uh, suggestions for for what you would like to see next. I think we will be back in a couple of weeks. Uh, but yeah, if you have uh, any ideas of, uh, of speakers you know or you would like to present something yourself, uh, please let us know. We'd be happy to, to have you and to consider your, your proposal. So I don't see other questions. So uh, Johan, good luck with the last eight days uh, of the Kickstarter. We were talking about projections just earlier. Uh, so I hope you guys will get a few a few more dollars, but I think you're uh, pretty much funded already. So it's going to be great to see the progress of your project in, in the next uh, in the next couple of months. And uh, yeah, thanks again for, for your time. Thanks. Thank you too also for uh, this, uh, this opportunity to uh, uh, tell our story. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Thanks. Bye.